Welcome to session three of AP Daily for Comparative Government and Politics. My name is Suzanne Bailey, and I teach at Virgil Grissom High School in Huntsville, Alabama, AKA the Rocket City. Come launch with me right now into a discussion on one of the most important topics in this exam. So what will we learn? What will we focus on today? We're gonna look at the executive, legislative, and judicial systems for all six core countries, which is um, one third of the multiple choice questions, as well as certainly gonna be a number of the free response questions as well. Uh, let's face it, you're taking an exam called AP Comparative Government and Politics. So we're gonna look at these branches of government. But in particular, we're gonna compare the, the structures themselves, presidential, parliamentary, and semi-presidential semi systems, but look at the checks on the executive branch, uh, executive term limits and methods of removal, and in particular, how democratic independent legislatures and independent judiciaries can establish rule of law. In essence, we're gonna look at where the power is organized, but also how do you control that power? Finally, we're gonna finish up with um, last year's conceptual analysis question uh, for free response number one and give us an option to give you some tips and helpful hints on how to answer conceptual questions. Also to help you, I wanted to make you aware of a Google Drive um, that you'll be able to access. So just hold up your phone right now and take this QR code, you'll be able to access that Google Drive or you can look at this tiny URL. Uh, what we have in there, Mrs. Knight, who is doing the videos with me, we have it, it organized by sessions. So in this session, I have a copy of the free response that we're gonna be working on. I actually have a copy of all the concepts that you would need for each of the units as you start this review. And finally, there is a chart, right, for, for unit two specifically, because there's a lot of information in this. And it's gonna be really hard to pick it all up at this point in time. But at this, hopefully what we're gonna be doing is reviewing, reviewing things that you already know. So consider one, maybe pausing the video and downloading this so you could take notes as you're going along or um, listen and see what you remember and then pull this down tomorrow and use it as a retrieval technique, right? See what you can fill in, what you remember. The more you can remember about how the processes work, right? How these institutions operate together, the easier this exam is gonna be. So, Let's warm up with a little trivia. Do you know who this is? Now keep in mind for the exam, there's not gonna be this kind of a trivia question. So if you knew this was Boris Johnson, who's the prime minister of the United Kingdom, then like ding, 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 right? Could give yourself a pat on the back. But why do I have it here? Why is it our image of the day? Is that I find and my students find helpful that like knowing the people involved in these six cases that we're looking at can help you remember the concepts. So Boris Johnson, do you know his story? Do you know how he became prime minister? You need to know, how do you get to be prime minister in a parliamentary system? Um, what does he get to do as prime minister? What are the powers of a prime minister? Um, that's something that you could look at that what are some of the things that, he, that Boris Johnson is doing? How could Boris Johnson lose his job, right? That's something that almost happened to him in, in January of this year when his uh, office was under um, criticism because of how they had handled some pro COVID protocols. So removal of a prime minister, either by a party or by a vote of no confidence, right, is something, a process that you would want to think about. So one strategy as we go through this system is as you learn the institutions and the theory behind how these countries work, perhaps think about the current leaders of those countries and how they got their office and what they're doing. Use current events to kind of help you make connections between concepts and scenarios um, that's really gonna help you on the exam. So are you ready? I'm gonna review political institutions of six countries, right? Hold on and let's look at this. I like to start with the fundamentals. I find that I'm, I'm an AP reader, have been an AP reader for over 20 years. And I find it when I'm reading essays or even reading my own students' essays that students have a tendency to forget the, the, the most basic aspect of how a government works, which is the three branches of government. 
So think to yourself, if I asked you, like, what's the purpose to describe the purpose of a legislative branch or an executive branch or a judicial branch, what would you say? Would you be able to tell me what those purposes are? Um, I'm obviously here to let you know, and hopefully like this makes perfect sense to you, but realize this is just a good place to start this whole unit. You know, legislatures make laws. Well, how does that happen in all six countries? Legislatures pass budgets that in, involved in spending. How does that happen in these six countries? What's the difference between an independent legislature and a legislature? Right, in the most authoritarian countries, we st their legislatures are making laws. So what makes it a democratic legislature, an independent legislature different? What's the purpose of the executive branch? We know that the executive branch enforces laws, they implement policies. So hopefully that helps you think about the bureaucracy because heads of government and heads of state can't do this by themselves. They need these um, unelected government officials to do that and they often select cabinets to help them not only advise them in their policy making process, but also to run these agencies and run the civil service. Finally, what is the role of the judiciary? We know the judiciary is to interpret the law and also you know, to, to, to adjudicate in criminal and civil issues, but what is what makes a judiciary independent and how is that going to be able to constrain the power of the executive? We know that governments have power and they have authority and the state itself has sovereignty. Here, how do you organize those structures, those institutions to exercise power? Predominantly, we're gonna focus on today in a lot of ways, what we really wanna focus on is how do you restrict the power of the executive? So you have to think about how is that executive chosen? What can the executive do? And how can that executive be removed? How can the other two branches control the executive? That's going to help us think about whether a regime is authoritarian or democratic and make a lot of other assumptions as we go through. So fundamentally, let's start, like, where do you go from the branches? How are the branches interrelated? So the two fundamental democratic institutional structures that we have to know of, these executive and legislative sessions, are the presidential system and the parliamentary system. So look at the diagram here on the screen and think about the process. Oftentimes you're asked to contrast these two things, a presidential system and a parliamentary system. So one of the major differences is how they're selected. Who are they being, you know, what, where is the accountability that you're gonna find within these systems? So notice the big distinguishing factor about a presidential system is that the voters select the president and they select the legislature. So presidential systems have separation of power and they're so separate that the voters are choosing them in separate elections, right? They could be on the same day or they could be on different days, but presidential systems are when you're keeping the power separate, right? That's how you're gonna restrain the executive is that you're gonna have these dueling um, institutions. Parliamentary systems can be just as democratic, but they're set up differently. In this case, the voters are picking the MPs, the ministers of parliament, and it's the party in parliament that's selecting a leader who becomes the prime minister. So that process, so think in your mind, I'm a big fan about sketching it out. Think, draw yourself, right? If voters select the president, select the legislature versus voters pick the MP, and then the legislature's picking the executive, right? That's what's happening in a parliamentary system. So that's just an, another way to contrast it, right, is not the differences between a presidential system and a parliamentary system is not only the way that they're selected, but how they're organized. So presidential systems are that true separation of powers. So when a president selects his or her cabinet, they have to be confirmed by the legislature. And they can't also be in the legislature, right? There's no, there's this, if you're in the executive branch, you can't be in the legislative branch. Well, that's very different than a parliamentary system where you have that fusion of powers. The prime minister is selecting his or her cabinet and all the members of the cabinet, right? The prime minister and the cabinet, the government are in the legislature. You have this fusion of power. So think about policymaking, like which one is it gonna be easier to get things done? 
well, when you're the prime minister and you propose a bill and um, you have the majority party to pass it, because if they don't, if you can't keep the majority of the confidence of the House, you could be removed, right, through a vote of no confidence. That's very different than a presidential system where the president may be proposing a law and the legislature doesn't like it and they veto that law. Um, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the legislature passes a law and the president vetoes that law. The legislature can go back with an override, right? And, and make that law into effect. So fundamentally think about these two situations, right? They're different ways of organizing power in democratic systems and so that they, they both are protecting, they're both accountable to the voters. They both have um, you know, constraints on the executive, but they're, situ they're structured very differently. So what can we do to help us see the differences between these systems? Well, one of the things to do is to look at the case studies, right? That's why we do these case studies so we can see, well, how does this actually work? How does this theoretical system work in these different countries? So let's start with our only presidential, I mean, our only parliamentary system, which is the UK. So here, right, um, kind of the, the pictures of Theresa May, who was the prime minister before Boris Johnson. But let's think about structure, right? For each of these countries, how do you get your power? What can you do when you're there? How do you get removed, right? How long do you get to stay? And what's the process of removal? So this is where the United Kingdom is your example of a parliamentary system, but it has some unique features. First of all, the monarch in the UK is your head of state. So she is your ceremonial leader. She is technically the commander in chief, right? It's her majesty's army, her majesty's navy. Um, how do you get to be prime minister? Keep in mind in this system, you're formally appointed by the queen, but she by tradition is picking the leader of the majority party. So the process, the parliamentary process is the same. The voters are picking the ministers of parliament, the largest party in parliament is selecting its leader, and then the queen is appointing the leader of that party. So that's how you get the job. So in this case, right, how did Theresa May get her job? The prime minister before her, David Cameron, had actually resigned. And so the party picked a new leader, and then the queen appointed Theresa May to be the prime minister. What do you get to do when you're the prime minister? Well, first of all, you choose, you select, she got to select her cabinet, members of her own party that she was gonna to use to help advise her, but also to run the bureaucracy. So the prime minister as head of government is in charge of policy making in the UK, um, determining both domestic and foreign policy. And notice it's serving as de facto commander in chief. The prime minister in the UK has the royal prerogative, acts on behalf of the queen, right? The queen's not the one who's deciding whether to go to war or not, that's the government. Um, and so it's the prime minister's decision um, to make foreign policy or to, to be in charge of the military. So where does the accountability come in, right? If you're the majority party, like, and you and they back you up and then they pass all the laws that you want them to pass. Like, where is the accountability um, within the system? Well, I think the reason I selected these images is, you know, here's a prime minister, obviously, you know, fighting for her life. You know, she came in to, to have a make a decision about Brexit, to make the policy about how the UK was going to leave the EU. And you can see it wasn't an easy thing to do. Her party picked her. Um, she even called for an election and um, her party had the, the most votes, right? It didn't have an actual majority, but it had the most votes and she was in charge of making these decisions, but it's difficult, right? She faced these weekly questions and prime minister question time and um, she was not able to pass her legislation. And for the most part, you know, a crisis in leadership, she had to give up her position. So there wasn't a new election. The Conservative Party picked Boris Johnson and he became the prime minister. Theresa May, for example, is still on the backbench, right? She is still in the House of Commons. So think again, how do you get power? What do you get to do when you're there? 
how do you leave? We'll contrast that with our two presidential systems. So our two presidential systems, one of which is Nigeria. So this is a, pre this is a picture of uh, former president, good luck Jonathan in the black hat and current president um, Buhari on the right. And so what is different about a presidential system? Well, first of all, presidents are both heads of state and head of government. So they're the policy leader and the ceremonial leader. Well, how do you get to be president? You're directly elected by the people. So keep in mind, the people in Nigeria are directly electing their president and they're directly electing their legislature. So they have a bicameral legislature. There's direct elections for the House of Representatives and the Senate. What's interesting about Nigerian presidential elections though, is that in order to make sure that there's really a consensus here, by the country, not only does the president have to get the most votes, the presidential candidate has to win 25% of the votes in two thirds of the states. So it has to show, right, that you have that, that common um, mandate from more than just your own part of Nigeria. Nigeria faces lots of very deep coinciding cleavages. And so this was a mechanism to make sure that there would be a consensual vote for the president. The president is the commander in chief, so is directing foreign policy, but also is in charge of domestic policy. And so keep in mind, what's the legislative process that he's involved in? He can propose legislation, but then the legislature has to, you need a majority of both houses of Congress um, to send him a bill that he then signs or vetoes. If he were to veto it, then they can override his veto. So that you can see right within there, those checks on his power. He does have the power to select a cabinet. Um, what's interesting, another consensual feature of Nigeria is what we call the federal character principle. By law, he has to select one member of every state to be in his cabinet, therefore to help advise him and help to implement policy. But in the end, he can be impeached and removed by the legislature. He also serves fixed terms. So two four-year terms, in this case, it was a pretty significant election when Good Luck Jonathan lost to Buhari. Um, Mr. Buhari had been a long time opposition candidate, had run for president many times and not won, um, but didn't stage a coup, right? Waited till the next election. And so Good Luck Jonathan, when he lost the election, he actually like stood down from power. It was a real sign of some consolidation of democracy in Nigeria and that presidential elections seem to be working. Well, how does that, so what's interesting, right, is to compare Nigeria with Mexico. Current president Manuel um, Lopez Obrador is also someone who ran for president um, several times and didn't win, came back, formed his own political party and is now the president of Mexico. So what does that mean? Well, he is the head of state and head of government. So because he is the president, he is directly elected by the people. But the difference, you wanna contrast that with Nigeria, he, um, the elections in Mexico are plurality. Whoever gets the most votes wins. So um, President um, Lopez Obrador is unique in that he's one of the few presidents um, of the last few presidents that actually got a majority of the vote. But keep in mind the presidents before him didn't get 50% of the vote and yet they were president of Mexico. What do you get to do once you're president? Commander in chief, so he's in charge of foreign policy. In addition, he's in charge of domestic policy. What's his role within the process? He's proposing laws um, to, to Congress. The, they have separate elections for Congress, right? The voters are voting for the president of Mexico and they're voting for the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies. Um, the Chamber of Deputies, you need a majority of both houses in order to pass a law. Um, the president can sign it or he can veto it and then they can override um, his veto. So just a classic kind of um, system that's set up. 
He also gets to select his cabinet. What's interesting here is that it has to be confirmed by the Senate, so that check on his authority, the people that he's gonna have to help him run the bureaucracy and implement policies are gonna have to have that check from the cabinet, I mean, check from the Senate. He can also be, and this is the, the controversial part, but from a presidential system standpoint, knowing that what's the process of removing a president, um, that would be the process of impeachment. The other contrast, which interesting with, with um, Nigeria, is that presidents of Mexico serve one six-year term. There's a longstanding non-reelection principle that in order to constrain the power of the executive, right, that they can't serve for another term. The non-reelection principle used to apply to the legislature as well, but that has been recently changed. Members of the legislature can run um, for um, more than one term, subsequent term the Mexican presidents cannot. So think about that. If you contrast that with a parliamentary system, there is no fixed term for a parliamentary system. You have to hold the confidence of your party and your party has to have the majority um, or the most seats in the parliament. So there's a very different issue here in terms of that constraint or control on um, the power of the executive, and that's something that would be interesting to sit and explore, perhaps, and, and talk about in a, in a class discussion. Then we come to the semi-presidential system. So the CED, which is the course and exam description, which we've also put in that Google Drive for you to look at, is clear that Russia is a semi-presidential system. Um, and so you need to know how it works. It's not a particularly democratic system. It's set up to model the French system. and so what are the elements? Like what is, makes it semi-presidential? You need to know that from a theoretical standpoint. Well, in this case, the presidential part is the president is elected directly by the people. So that's a direct election, a two battle ballot election. The president must win a majority on the first round. The, the candidate has to win a majority on the first round or there'll have to be a runoff. Um, the president is the head of state, but this is where the dual executive action comes in. They have, Russia has a prime minister and the prime minister is appointed by the president and confirmed by the Duma. So they're gonna split up those roles, right? The president is the head of state, the prime minister is the head of government. The president's gonna be in charge of foreign policy, the prime minister is gonna be in charge of domestic policy. Um, the, in terms of where does the legislature come in, the voters are also electing the lower house, um, the Duma, the state Duma, in both um, single member district and proportional elections. How do you get removed? Like once you're there, right, the president's doing foreign policy, um, the prime minister is doing domestic policy, realize that the removal process is going to be depending on their role. You know, how do you remove, how does the legislature remove a president? That would be through the process of impeachment. How do you remove a prime minister? It would be through a vote of no confidence. Presidents in Russia can serve two six-year terms. That's a change. It started off as four years. It was changed to six years. There's been recent constitutional amendment. So the kind of like set it back at zero. So technically President Putin could be elected for two um, more six-year terms. Well, that's a lot. That's a lot of information. And so that's why I encourage you with the chart and to think about this more than once. But just to step back, like, how are you gonna be tested? How am I gonna be tested on these things? Well, it's, it's a, whether it's a multiple choice or a free response, you're gonna have to understand how to describe the differences between these concepts. And that's a general thing to think about for all concepts on this exam. You're comparing them. So what's the difference between the terms? Um, I always like to remind people that this particular question is not asking you like, what is a presidential system and what is a parliamentary system like what we've just done? It's asking you to make an explicit comparison. So what's the easiest way to answer a question like this is to use the words in the question. If I ask you to describe a difference, tell me what the difference is. So if, for example here, a difference between a presidential and a parliamentary system is the method of selection of the executive, right? In a presidential system, the president is chosen by popular vote. 
Whereas in a parliamentary system, the prime minister is selected by the largest coalition or party in the legislature. So that's, that's and the, the notice here, I can answer this question without using specific country information. But having that country information can help me make sure I'm keeping it correct. And I want to let you know as a reader, if it helps you to say, for example, and tell me about what happens in either country, just to keep, you know, that hopefully you're thinking that, right, to help you write the answer. Always feel free to give a country specific example if it helps you um, make your point. It's not required, right? There's nothing here that says talk about a specific country, but you can use that information um, if it helps you make your description. So you might be curious, well, what about Iran and China? Well, they're not presidential, parliamentary, or semi-presidential systems. So that's the good thing. You won't have a question about them as being presidential or parliamentary or semi-presidential because they're not. It doesn't mean you're off the hook, though. You still have to know how do you acquire power, what do you do once you're there, and how can you be removed? Um, Obviously, the thing to know about Iran is that it's a theocracy. So that's a kind of authoritarian state that's run by religious leaders. It's also important to recognize the importance of the guardian council in this process. So for example, this is a picture here. Um, the, the, the man on the right is the current president Raisi. So when Mr. Raisi wanted to run for office, he had to apply to run for the presidency. And several hundred people applied to run for the presidency and the Guardian Council let seven be on the ballot. And so he is directly elected. He can serve up to two four-year terms together. He also has to get a majority of the vote, which he was able to do on his first election. It's interesting to go back and look at earlier elections, right, uh, where um, there had to be a second round ballot. So he won a majority on his first round, and he's here being given um, the seal of office from the Supreme Leader. What does the president of Iran get to do? Well, keep in mind, presidents get to select cabinets. So cabinets are groups of advisors to help them um, advise them and to help them run their bureaucracy. Typically, because they're going to be executing or implementing the law that's passed by the legislature, again, we're going to give them that opportunity to confirm. So he'll be confirmed by the majlis, which is the legislature, a unicameral legislature, also directly elected by the people. The supreme leader, which in retrospect, right, should maybe put this at the top, I and mean, that's, that's where the power is in Iran. And the supreme leader is chosen by the assembly of experts. Right, the assembly of experts can choose the supreme leader and technically have the authority to remove, although they never have. But the power of Iran is in the supreme leader, and a lot of it is in this appointment power. Um, he's commander in chief. He appoints half the guardian council. He appoints the chief justice, who appoints the other half of the guardian council. He appoints the expediency council. It really would behoove you to spend some time making sure, right? You understand, you know, how policy is made in Iran, even though it's not a presidential or a parliamentary system. China, even though it has a president and a prime minister or premier, is not a semi-presidential system. So it's not just having someone who's called a president or having someone who's called a prime minister that defines those systems. Right? It's the method of selection and the separation of powers. China and Iran are, you know, have on, on a constitution have separation of powers, but the, clearly the authority is, is vested in Iran and the supreme leader. And in China, it's a here in President Xi Jinping. So where does all his power and authority come from? It comes from, it emanates right from his position as general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party but also as being president of China, he's the commander in chief and the chair of the Central Military Commission. So um, how does he get his job, right? That's something that you would wanna know. He's appointed by the legislature. So the, the, it's a unicameral legislature in China, the National People's Congress, they're gonna appoint the president. But let's face it, 
how do they make that decision? That decision is being made at the party level in the standing committee of the Politburo. Xi Jinping has amassed an amazing amount of power, right? This is, there's a formal process, a formal constitutional process that the National People's Congress is the most powerful institution in China. Um, Right, it it chooses selects the the president. It has to pass the laws, but as a group, as a body of three thousand people that meets a couple weeks a year, you realize in China that it's a much more complex than that. Um, the president nominates the premier, who's going to oversee the state council and the civil service. And the president of China serves a renewable five year term. There used to be a two-term limit, but that has been removed in the constitution. And so that's something to watch for in next November, right? The expectation is that Xi Jinping will have a, a, a third term as general secretary and then be um, reappointed as the president of China, again, is what we're expecting. All right. So the last part, just to kind of think about when you, you know, how do you get to be an executive? How can you be removed? Where do these other branches come into play? Well, primarily, if you're going to talk about effective checks on authority, you have to look at independent legislatures and independent judiciaries. So realize it's democracies that are going to hold the power of the executive accountable. The, the, the government is gonna be accountable to the voters and there's gonna be that horizontal accountability between the branches. So even a fusion of branches in the UK where the executive and legislator refused that there are real checks and balances going on about authority and authority is constrained. And so um, when you want to think to yourself about like how do democracies work? How do they restrain the power of the executive Oftentimes you wanna think about the role of the legislature and the judiciary. The legislature can pass laws that restrict the power of the executive branch, right? They can pass laws that protect civil liberties. And then if you have an independent judiciary, that independent judiciary is gonna uphold the rule of law and make sure that no government official, right, is can arbitrarily seize power or whatever. Um, I've included the Supreme Court and legislatures of Mexico and Nigeria here, right? They're not as strong as the consolidated democracy of the UK, but they, they, they show some independence. And in that case, right, and can be a real check on the power of the executive in both of those countries. So that's a lot of information. So again, think about what you've taken in but do take the opportunity to practice it, writing it out. Can you explain how each of these people are chosen, what they can do when they're there and how they can be removed? And why is it important, right? We wanna make that transition between what you've focused on with democratization and um, these issues of how the institutions work. So let's look at a conceptual analysis, free response. The free res first free response that you're gonna see on your test is going to notice there's nothing here about countries. So it's just gonna be about concepts. And so that's why in the Google doc, I included all the concepts you have, because what you're gonna be asked to do on these is the first thing you're gonna be asked to do is to define something. And defining is hard. It's one of, actually one of the more difficult points to get because you have to be so precise in your answer so that it can't be misconstrued with another word. So, recommendation, right? Not only pra practice defining them, you know, flashcards and those kind of things are good when you're just recognizing them, but make sure that you're actually writing out what you need to do. So let's just think about some of the strategies about how to answer a free response. The first thing you want to do, right? Read the question. I recommend that you highlight the task verbs, define, or you won't have a highlighter. So circle the task verbs. Define, describe, explain, explain how. Underline your concepts. You know, these are the key content vocabulary that you should recognize that the reader needs for you to explain that you know the difference. So notice here that the way these are set up, they're always gonna be worth four points. The first one is gonna be a definition of a term. The second one's gonna be some kind of description oftentimes clarifying the difference between something or maybe describing how something works. How do you get to be a prime minister? How do you get to be a president? Um, C, notice that explain. 
explain needs some kind of analysis. You know, they might strengthen law by doing this or because of this, right? So make sure that you're explaining how. And then notice what the last one does. It, it, it takes you to what you've been talking about where you've drilled down deep that you really know this content and apply it to a different concept, in this case, political participation. So feel free to pause the video at this point in time and kind of like sketch out what you might want to say. Or if you're just going to listen to me through, make sure you, you take it out of the drive tomorrow or the next day and try yourself, right? And come back and check that you're in the right place. So notice here, this is define rule of law. So define rule of law, specific definition is no one is above the law, including government officials. So the key here is not just that you and I as citizens have to obey the law, but that the government officials have to obey the law. The other thing to, con to can keep in mind is when you're like trying to decide the difference between Democrat and authoritarian regimes is realize that rule of law is a really strong indicator of a democracy. And you're only gonna have rule of law if you have an independent legislature and an independent judiciary. So that those are gonna be important characteristics, right? That are gonna help you as you, you know, you, you don't have to talk about a specific country, but you wanna make that connection between rule of law and democracy. So what about describing a difference between rule of law and rule by law? Remind yourself that this isn't asking you to define rule by law, it's saying what's the difference. So start your answer with the difference is. The difference is, is how citizens are treated, right? Under rule of law, everyone, including government officials is bound by the law. But rule by law is when government officials arbitrarily apply the law, particularly not to themselves, right? There's gonna be much more corruption under rule by law. So what could a state do to strengthen rule of law? Well, remind yourself that democracies have institutional structures to strengthen rule of law. So whether it's a separation of powers under a presidential system or whether you have that, that vote of confidence, right, in a parliamentary system, what are some ways that you could strengthen rule of law? Well, in the end, it's making sure that those checks on the executive work. Right, so impeachment or removal processes, we want to hold the executive accountable. So what makes those systems you know, democratic, right, is that you have the legislature is actually gonna hold the executive accountable. Um, so you notice there's two different things, right? That you're focusing on the legislature, so an independent legislature that's gonna hold them responsible, or perhaps, right, making sure that you have an independent court now keep in mind, the UK Supreme Court does not have judicial review, but by tradition, the British, the British government supports that. In the end though, in this case, you're not using a specific country. So how a Supreme Court that actually uses judicial review against the actions of an executive, right, is gonna be able to uphold rule of law. Last one, so this last one, you kinda, you've, you've gotta think about what's happening here, right? The absence of rule of law. So if there's no rule of law, you have rule by law, there's arbitrariness. How does that affect whether people participate? Political participation, right, is when people make their voice heard, whether by voting, whether by um, freedom of speech or press or assembly or petition. So if you think about both terms, what they mean, then put them together and come up with an answer. But realize, right, one, it could increase protest because people would be against the corrupt leaders um, that aren't following, right? Rule of law means they're being arbitrarily done. And so people may protest that issues. Or don't forget about pro-government protests. Russia in particular, right? Putin is very good about like getting out crowds of pro-government protests. Now they may be coerced, they may be forced to do that, they may be paid, right? But realize the participation can be voluntary, but it can also be coerced. But we'll go over that, right? Um, in later sessions when we focus on um, political participation.
So in the end, what should you take away from all this, this very important unit? Um, really explain the differences, know your terms, know and be able to explain presidential and parliamentary systems, how they're different. Know the executive term limits and method of removal for all six countries, right? Know what they are for presidential and parliamentary systems, but also know how they work in the six countries. Know your difference between rule of law and rule by law that's really going to help you tie the institutions together with democracy, right? Those things from unit one and unit two we continue to build on. And then this know that you're going to have this first conceptual essay that's going to be just on concepts, right? No country specific is required. So get some practice at writing out those definitions. And also, don't be afraid to use the examples to really make sure that you've made your points. You don't have to use them, but we're always glad to read them if they're accurate and correct. So thank you for joining me um, on this review session. I enjoyed um, talking. It's one of my favorite units. So uh, please listen. Please check out the Google Drive and um, get pull, pull down those resources and join us again tomorrow um, for another edition of AP Daily Live.